Good afternoon, everyone. You're surprised by the English now, right? <laughs> Seriously, it was non-existent in 1986. But you know, children, as we've just heard, are capable of incredible feats, just giving the room and the opportunity to thrive. Um, I'm, not, I'm not strictly here as a speaker. I'm here as a performer. I'm a musician. Um, I'm a jazz guitarist, um, initially, anyway. Um, but I will play something for you. Um, but I was asked by the organizers. I met one of the organizers in February of this year. He, it was his birthday, and him and a few friends decided they saw the name of a Nigerian jazz musician on a brochure for a jazz club in Streatham, South London. And they decided to come out and, uh, and see what was going on. And uh, I met um, Paddy and Igbo and, and a few of his friends there. And um, we kept in touch, you know, because for me, just like it was for them, it's always a, a, a thing of pride when you see a fellow Nigerian or African excelling in their field. Um, it should no longer come as a surprise to us because, you know, I go to the cinema all the time and every time the film finishes, I'm one of those aficionados that likes to read the credits and there's always some African deeply embedded, you know, into what's going on and they, you know, and they're usually, usually at the top of their game, you know. Um, not because of anything other than the fact that I know what it was life like for me when I first moved over to the UK, age 10, um, it was very difficult to get people to um, see things your way, as it were. I was saying to some of the ladies in the back of the stage there that um, now African uh, culture has become something that's exportable to a certain extent. At least the pop culture has. Um, and so what I'm going to do is just quickly tell you a story about myself and some of the things that I hope um, to leave you with today. I came to uh, London age nine and mm, quick math seven months and a few hours um, in the summer luckily uh, I didn't have to face the cold straight away and um, and and you know truth be told I didn't speak much English but in the I you know giant signed on to primary school in that September and had to very 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 quickly um, become as fluent and as well embedded into the system, as you can hear in my accent now. I mean, I go to most places now, and even, even when I go to Nigeria, people look at me, Rasta, yes, you know. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I look Nigerian in my face, as far as I know, but, uh, you know, for, for whatever reason, um, you no longer fit in to everyday life, but that's cool. Um, one of the things that um, being here for so long did for me was that it allowed me to embrace my culture um, sometimes I, f I feel more than those who are still growing up and living back home in Nigeria and other parts of Africa. And I tell you what it has done for me. It's meant that I've, um, I've sought out history, but not Western history, African history, especially Nigerian history, especially Yoruba history. And um, about two years ago, no, three years ago, I got a phone call from a, 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 a notable a British jazz musician by the name of Courtney Pine. And then he said, I'm going to Nigeria to play at the first International Lagos Jazz Festival. Would you like to accompany me? I was like, would I heck, you know? <laughs> Let's go, you know, kind of vibe. And I, I got the call, I was shopping in Tesco in, uh, near Boston Manor, West London. My girlfriend lives, used to live around there. We were shopping in Tesco and the call came. And I, as soon as the call finished, I put the phone down, I turned to her and I just burst out in tears. And it wasn't because um, I was getting a gig because I've got lots of gigs, you know. It was because somebody saw the fact that, you know, this dude is from this place. It makes sense. You know, he's good enough. Well, for starters, Courtney Pine felt I was good enough to play with him. That was already a big um, overwhelming fact for me. But then it was the fact that I was going to finally get to go home after 21 years. Um, I hadn't seen any of my, my cousins. Uh, my, my father had been married. I had other siblings who the oldest is, was at that time already uh, 13 um, I hadn't met any of them, you know, I hadn't seen my grandmother who I grew up with um, in 20, close to 22 years. So it felt like a thing of pride to be going back and going back as something, as someone. Because I tell you what, when I started out on this music road, you know, you know the usual story, you're not going to be Sonia Day, so you might as well forget that one and just read your books. You know, you know, the, the, same, the same vibe. Um, and it was that thing of, uh, my, mom, my mom used to hide my guitar 
you know, so I would, I would get back from, I started playing about, about the age of 17. And I would go to college. At the time, I was studying law, economics, and English, you know, the, the big three. Well, actually, accounting is not there, so not quite complete. Um, and I would get back from uni, I would try to find my guitar. I got to practice, I got to play. You know, I fell in love with this thing. And um, she would hide it, and I would find it, and I would play it, and she would beat me. And in that cycle, and I was 17, you know, quite grown, but, you know, I guess when you have to raise six boys on your own, you become something of a, a Thatcherite, you know. Um, and that cycle perpetuated itself over like the first three or four years of me picking up the guitar. Eventually, this, this same mother of mine, who I, I'm, I hope she doesn't watch this, <laughs> um, said to my, she came to see me play at the London Jazz Festival two years ago at the Barbican. And on the, I dropped her and my, my younger brother home. My brother was moaning about something or other. Oh, mom, I want to play my computer game, you know, and all this kind of stuff. I said, ah, go and learn piano. Can you see your brother? Go and learn piano, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> and for me, that for me was, was it's probably one of the, the biggest victories I've ever had in my life, you know? She actually finally saw it my way, you know, she saw what was possible. And actually brings me on to what I want to say. Um, since I've been going back to Nigeria, since I first went with Courtney, um, one of the things that I've noticed um, about our continent is that although, although one of the speakers said earlier that Africa is built on art, you know, the art that comes out of Africa is, um, how, how can I best put it, is, is unmatched in, in its particular style by anywhere else. And um, we don't appreciate it enough. We don't support it enough. It's not funded at all. There are, there are hundreds and thousands of musicians in Nigeria alone who, given the right support, can create musical concepts that will literally drag Africa out of poverty. Now, it's interesting because we talk about, you know, I've heard everybody speak today, and we talk about using um, business and financial institutions to create wealth and taxation. But the fact of the matter is that um, as old as the oldest profession in the world are the troubadours, traveling musicians who brought joy and also all manner of things through music. Now don't get me wrong, I know that currently the Nigerian music market is, ex is exploding in the, in the form of Afro pop. Now there's a difference when I say entertainment and artistic music. Um, I deal in artistic music. I've been very, very fortunate to have been given a couple of grants by the Arts Council of England here to create some of the concepts that I have in my mind. And one of them I will play you some tunes from um, just in a minute. And I was very fortunate. But when I got to Nigeria, what I found that a lot of young musicians suffered from was that kind of support that I was getting here. They were, they were no less gifted than I, than, you know, than I thought I was. They were no less capable. It's just that I had all these opportunities that they didn't have. And when I spoke to a few people and said, what would, what would benefit you most, really, as a musician? They said, well, I'd like my mom and dad to get off my back, for starters. Um, and I felt, well, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a, something you, you'll have to win on your own. Um, but at the same time, it's the level of support, not just, um, from, society, not just from society, but from governments. You know, um, in this country, the government is all too happy to throw money at you if you have a concept that they feel is going to benefit the community from an artistic perspective. And also, um, music education or art education isn't really taken as seriously as it could do um, or could be. And I feel that if, if, if we could look at changing the ideas and the way we think, because musicians are very low on the food chain in Africa. I mean, let's not beat about the bush, you know. What made names like Fela Kuti and Sonny Ade wasn't the fact that they played music in Nigeria. It was the recognition they got outside of Nigeria, which then traveled back into Nigeria, which made them go, ah, if those people are looking at you like that, it means you must be somebody. You know, that kind of attitude. And, and that's exactly what it is, you know. And, um, and with that, you know, I'm, I'm going to uh, play you some music. This music comes from uh, an album I've just recorded, just got released in September. Um, the title of the album is Orimeta, uh, which is from the Yoruba di uh, language. For those of you who don't know what that means, that just simply means three songs. Three songs because at a point in my life, I started to think about reconnecting deeper with my Yoruba roots. Not just on, in fact, not on a musical level at all, more on a cultural, historical level. I wanted to understand the language better. There were certain words my mom would say, and although I'm very fluent in Yoruba, still, I still think in Yoruba, funny enough. Um, I wanted to reconnect really deeply, and I started to read up um, you know, the history of the tribal 
um, set up in that region of West Africa. And it led me to look at the song culture, the song culture of West Africa, where there were literally songs for everything. You know, you wake up in the morning, there's a song. You go to bed at night, there's a song. You're going to work, there's a song. You're feeding your kids, there's a song. You know, there's a song for everything. You're getting married, there's a song. And not there's a song as in, you know, you, you play a CD at a party. No, this song was specifically written for that specific action at any given time. And it happened all the time. And, um, and it was one thing my grandma once said to me, that if you want to have a good life, all you got to do is live every day of your life good. And all of those good, one good days will equal to one good life. And so I started thinking about life as a, as a, a macrocosm of a day, being the microcosm. And, uh, you know, being born as you wake, living as you live your day, and dying as you go to sleep at night. And those inspired certain sounds and certain songs, which for me as a jazz musician, um, that's, that's all you need. You just need a little bit of, of, of morsel, and you can create so much. So I'm going to invite onto stage um, um, Ayon the First, who you've heard lots of. He actually played on my album. Um, to come and join me. And we're going to do one song for you right now. The title of this song is Asiko Aye, which means uh, this moment in time, roughly. It's kind of weird. You know, the language is hard to sometimes translate properly. And um, it simply speaks about um, the story of a man who realizes one day that the, the problems on the planet are as much to do with his own inactivity as they are to do with the inactivity of others, you know, continually, blame, continuously blaming others for your lack of and realizing that your lack of sometimes is down to you. So enjoy. La 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 no, sa la la no, la 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 no, la 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 no, la 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 no, la 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 Ninu on go go tonche, if you are a lamon or a ratty or a jotting cow jong. Ibera do queen, Ilea ye tawa yo, oh, can show show, ni yamwa tauri. A la pianicon, lole tewa lorum, and niba fekoba. Moti soro ti mo ni so Ibeke le ni yon Asan lori asan ni Efi yogban she iti yoto Ohun re re ti an she Lo le mo aye toro Ranti ala jotin kao jon Kini ohun tam wa ti an fi Jarawa Taba Wolotu Tasi Wolo Wosi Alafianico Lolete Walo and Iba Feku Motisoro Timo Niso.
Asiko ayetawai, o da bi eni ti o mo, o o tu si o o si. Ninu ongo go tunche, ifara la manare, mati yola joti kajo. Kini o uta wa ti anfi ya jarawa, taba wolo tu ta si wo lo wo si. Ala fiani kon lo le te wa lo run, eni ba fe kubo. Muti soro ti mo ni so. La 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 no, la 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 no. La la na i do do we do di do. La 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 do we do, sa la la no. La 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 i do na i do no. La 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 na i do na i do no. La 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 i do na i do no. Sa la 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 no. La 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 no, la la. Spread on the wall, spread on the wall, la 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 la. So la 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 you know the wall, but the spread on the wall, oh 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 oh. La 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 no, la. Thank you.